I'm Agnieszka Niemark, and this is the Boyce Thompson Institute Centennial Oral History Project. My interviewee today is Ben Williams, Alan Renwick, Bob Cahut, Claire Castile, Daniel Klesik, John Dentis, Laura Phillips, Luke Colavito, Robert Last, Zohara Yaniv Bahrach. Thank you so much for taking part in this project. Alan Renwick, presently an emeritus faculty member at BTI, first connected with the Institute in 1960 after finding contributions from the Boyce Thompson Institute, the house journal published by the Institute at his technical college in Scotland. Now the place where I worked was the Horticultural Research Institute and there I found the, the contributions of the Boyce Thompson Institute. I looked at the, the Boyce Thompson Institute and uh, wrote a letter not knowing who it would go to seeing that I was interested in finding a job and um, maybe an opportunity to go to graduate school. And to my surprise, uh, um, a week later, I got a letter from the managing director, Dr. George McNew. <clears throat> and he said, well, we, it sounds like you've got an interesting background. Uh, why don't you give us a call when you get to New York and we, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> So I made all my arrangements and um, I took all my worldly belongings in a trunk, which I took on the plane. It was, in those days, it was an old prop plane. It took 11 hours to cross the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. And on Monday morning, I got up and um, called Boyce Thompson. We uh, talked for about an hour and they said, well, uh, sound as if you're qualified, um, we'll offer you a job. And um, I said, fine, um, when do you want me to start? He said, how about tomorrow? Luke Colavito arrived at BTI in 1963 and retired from the Institute in 1990. He talks about how he ended up at the Institute. I went up to the New York State Employment Agency in White Plains, New York, and they they were kind of uh, unsure about (laughs) how how to find a job for me. And I suggested, why don't you call the New York Botanical Gardens? And they suggested this place called Boyce Thompson Institute. I had never heard of it. And I worked for uh, Walter Tolecki. He was um, a specialist in sort of a new uh, part of uh, science, uh, plant tissue culture. And my job was to maintain the cell lines and perform uh, whatever experiments we needed calling for these different plant tissue cultures. Ben Williams was the first BTI Director of Public Affairs and worked at BTI between 1984 and 1994. Ben explains why he was chosen by BTI's Managing Director in the early 1980s, Roy Young, for the job. I had worked at the university for a number of years and was familiar with the the operation. Um, Part of my work was in fundraising, which was uh, important, in fact, perhaps critical to Boyce Thompson at that time. Or maybe he thought I could be more of a, uh, an advisor, a guide, um, helping to bridge the gap and bring Boyce Thompson more prominently into uh, life in the community. Bob Kohut, current emeritus faculty member, was a scientist at BTI from 1980 until he retired in 2004. He talks about how his friend John Lawrence recruited him to BTI from an environmental consulting firm in Colorado. I'm out there in Colorado one day and the phone rings. And I answer the phone and it's my buddy John. And he says to me, you know, we're, the Institute is going to start a new research program. Uh, It's gonna be funded by the EPA and it's going to look at the response of agricultural crops to controlled levels of ozone in the field. Are you interested? Yeah, I'm interested, man. (laughs) Uh, I came to Ithaca, I interviewed with Len Weinstein, and uh, I got a job offer. Zohara Yaniv Bakrak conducted research at BTI from 1967 until the Institute moved to Ithaca in 1978. She talks about how she was recruited to BTI by Dick Staples. 
Well, he did offer me to be a postdoc in his laboratory and I accepted it. So I was pregnant at that time. So I said it would be only fair if I tell him in advance that uh, within a few months I will have to, um, to be away for a short time. And he told it to Professor McNew, who uh, was the head of the institute. He said, wow. I am afraid that you did a mistake. You are losing your postdoc. She will not come back. How can she? Her first pregnancy and her first baby. So Dick told me and I said, don't worry, everything will be okay. So when I came to back to the Institute, Dr. McClure was full of happiness. He was so happy to see me coming back. Dan Klesig arrived at BTI in 2000. He talks about how he was recruited from Rutgers University's Waxman Institute. When Ralph Harding was president, he asked Charlie Arnson to do a review of BTI, and Charlie asked um, Joan, uh, Joanne Curry and myself to help him with that review. I was going more and more into plants, so I said, this is a much better place to do plant research than, than uh, Rutgers, even though Rutgers was now coming along. Uh, so I asked Charlie, you know, could I come as a, uh, as a senior scientist? And he was quite excited about it, but realized that didn't, there weren't any openings. But I guess within a year or two, like maybe two years, he uh, approached me again and said, Dan, I'm going to step down at the end of my five-year term. Would you consider applying for the presidency? And Greg Martin uh, also asked me to consider it. We met at a meeting, or he approached me at a meeting in, in Europe. Um, and so I threw my hat in the ring, and that's how I got, became the president. John Dentes, BTI's chief financial officer from 1982 to 2010, describes how being hired at BTI was like coming home. Uh, you know, um, coming to BTI, or going to BTI, was like coming home. I was born and raised in Ithaca then Cornell University College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I took another year and I got my MBA. I earned my MBA from what was then called the School of Business and Public Administration, now the Johnson School. In many, many ways, it was a perfect setup for Boyce Thompson. So we're running 90 to 100 mini projects, and that's pure job shop accounting with a not-for-profit spin and throw in a layer of government accountability and, and you have Boyce Thompson and you have something that was a lot of fun to work on. Robert Last, former BTI faculty member and currently University Distinguished Professor at Michigan State University, discusses his path to BTI. Met up with Ralph Hardy, maybe, I, I'm sure I met Ralph during the interview, but I, I remember uh, quite well meeting up with Ralph. Uh, he was in uh, in Cambridge, uh, Mass, for a uh, for a business meeting, and we had breakfast together at his hotel in Harvard Square. Remember this very well. There are some moments in one's life that one remembers quite well, uh, and we had a really great conversation uh, about his, you know, vision and and the institute's vision for continuing to 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 grow and expand in in molecular biology across the institute. Claire Castile, a postdoctoral researcher in the Jander Lab from 2010 to 2014 and currently associate professor at Cornell, describes her path to the Jander Lab. I went out and interviewed at Boyce Thompson Institute. I was really excited about the experience. Um, I ha didn't know much about these research institutes, um, but I knew about a few of them, like the Danforth Center and um, the Noble Foundation and um, Boyce Thompson Institute. But, Boyce Thompson Institute was seemed a little different because it was right in the campus of Cornell. And so on my interview, I met not only lots of the scientists at um, BTI, but also some people from Cornell. Um, it just seemed like a very, people were excited and they were very happy. And I, I felt like I could be very happy and excited there too. Laura Phillips served on the BTI Board of Directors between 2006 and 2018. She was the co-vice chair of the board 2009 to 2013 and the chair of the board 2014 to 2018. She recalls how she joined the board. I knew of BTI, but I didn't really know very much about it. Then Ezra Cornell had been a longtime friend and contact. He 
approached me and said there, were, there might be an opportunity that was a good match for me at BTI. And the caliber of research at BTI was incredibly impressive. So I became interested and I accepted the opportunity. Alan Renwick discusses the social life at the Institute during the 1960s and 1970s when BTI was located in Yonkers. The Institute had a, a lady who came in to cook lunches for us. <clears throat> and um, she saw me and said, you know, I was pretty skinny at that time. She said, you need fattening up. So she would give me extra servings. We had a, a volleyball court outside the, the Institute. So we played there at lunchtime. Uh, some of us went on ski trips. We went to the World's Fair in New York in 1964, I think that was. I got to know people and uh, I <clears throat> got together with other uh, bachelors and we uh, actually rented houses together. And uh, some of these people became my best friends and, and still are, in fact. <laughs> Luke Calavito talks about the housing situation when BTI was located in Yonkers. The Institute had bought up all the land around it. There was one home that nobody seemed to want. It was the on the golf course, on the edge of the golf course, but it had been used to clean a lot of equipment and they had a solvent uh, that really ranked, it smelled terrible, and nobody wanted it. But didn't bother us <laughs> and luckily they did take the tank away and we we got this uh, wonderful uh, home I, I i was only uh, like about oh a 10 minute walk from the institute and i would cut across the grounds of the uh, golf course and uh it had snowed and i really didn't know my way too well and i fell in a sand trap <laughs> up to my uh, waist in snow um, I thought, this is a funny place to die. <laughs> ben Williams explains the public relations aspect of his position and how he tried to raise the profile of the Institute and help integrate it into the local community. Help build the reputation of the Institute. It uh, carried on some very sophisticated plant research, and but it was not well known. We did that through working with the Cornell News Bureau where we would have press releases about major scientific developments that took place at Boyce Thompson. And the other part of it was uh, bringing Boyce Thompson into not only the Cornell community, but also the Ithaca community and making it a, uh, a vital part of the overall community picture. Zohara Yaniv Bakrak discusses studying protein synthesis of the ureta spore of bean rust with Dick Staples. What happens to the parasite if it only uh, if it only lands on water? What stops the biochemistry of it? Does it have a protein synthesis like a normal uh, plant, or it, it's a different one? And we did find that it's a different protein synthesis and a different DNA synthesis and we were able to isolate a few uh, key enzymes and to show the dependency of this parasite and how the surface of the leaf triggers the germination of the spore and triggers so that the spore, the spore which is the, like the seed of the rust fungus, the spore can germinate and can begin its begin its penetration into the leaf and therefore the whole biochemistry is aimed to be successful um, on, this, uh, on this process. John Dentes recounts how the close relationship between managing director Roy Young and eventual board member Roy Park Sr. helped mobilize members in the local business community along with Dean Charles Palm at Cornell to lobby officials in the New York State government to facilitate BTI's move to the Cornell campus rather than to Oregon State University. The names that come to mind are David Cutting, a local uh, automobile dealership owner, Roy Van, Ray Van Hout, um, the president of the Tompkins County Trust Company, and uh, Tony DiGiacomo, and also Dean Palm. Uh, those four individuals, by the way, were instrumental in flying to, uh, to Albany on a very snowy winter evening to convince uh, Governor Malcolm Wilson 
of uh, the desirability of keeping Boyce Thompson in New York State, not moving to Oregon, and building a building and, uh, and uh, enticing us to stay, enticing Boyce Thompson to stay. Rob Last discusses synergies between the Institute's traditional strength in environmental biology and his new lab studying plant molecular biology in the early 1990s. It was a, a really good uh, synergy, uh, a set of uh, possibilities between uh, some of the, the organismal physiologists, folks who are interested in what happens to a tree when it's out in acid rain or um, in a sulfur dioxide rich environment. But my interests were in these little tiny plants, not in great big plants, uh, uh, but they're re really great synergy. So uh, for, uh, for example, Bob Amundsen, who was a, a staff scientist, I guess, at, or a faculty member at the time in, in environmental biology, and uh, his group uh, with Rich Reba, um, and, and my group, uh, Jai Young Lee, and, and, and uh, originally Jai Young Lee and, and, and others in, in, in my group, um, established a collaboration really quite informally, which led to some really, you know, some, some of my most highly cited papers. Claire Castile responds to a question about what aspect of her training at BTI she considered the most important. In George's lab, it was the first time I really felt like an equal as a scientist and like I deserve this part, uh, this place at the table. You know, I am, you know, he respected me and made me feel like my opinions mattered. And I think that was a big deal. He would ask me to look at grants for him and, you know, we worked on grants together. He also was really generous with his time and um, talking about science and ideas. Um, that helped me generate and start to develop my own ideas. Dan Klesig talks about the challenges he faced as a new president of the Institute. The physical plant was, was quite good in many regards, um, but in some regards was not appropriate for some of the research. Research programs were now larger, laboratories were little two or three man modules. We made a much larger so it could accommodate larger research groups. We uh, increased the number of cold rooms and common equipment for doing biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, and then we made a massive change in the growth chambers uh, with the help of George Jander, who we had moved, we had recruited. He had worked at, NI, uh, at Monsanto and they were uh, ending a, a program in the Boston area and we were able to have them uh, donate, essentially, uh, several thousand square feet of growth chambers. So it dramatically increased our capacity. Laura Phillips talks about the creation of the Scientific Advisory Board in 2014. So we had world-class scientists who were very happy to come and be advisors to this crown jewel of an organization with you know, world-class research going on. It was, it was really a plus to be involved in, in an advisory capacity, a scientific advisory capacity. But many folks that are really terrific at that role, not so interested in being involved in a board. So these were really di almost disparate parts that were trying to be into one organization. So we'd already bifurcated that as I came on the board and we created this separate entity which was now called the Scientific Advisory Board. Bob Kohut discusses the history of the environmental biology group at BTI and the leadership of Leonard Weinstein. Everybody worked on every other project. I mean, it was, uh, it was really interactive. Um, and so it was, it was a good group to be in. Leonard was the program director, a great guy. Uh, I mean, I've always felt beholden to Leonard. Unfortunately, he's passed away, but I always felt beholden to him as having given me the opportunity to come to the Institute, as well as John Lawrence for calling me that day and asking me if I was interested. Um, so I feel really fortunate having had this opportunity to work at BTI, it's a great place. Environmental biology is a great place. And I feel that I've been really blessed having the opportunity to do the kinds of things I wanted to do as a kid and knowing the people that I knew and was able to work with. 
um, I've been very fortunate. Thank you so much for today. I hope the centennial celebration will be another occasion to meet people that you work with some time ago. And thank you so much for today.